Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, YouTubers. This is Jerry Diamond with How to Get Out of Babylon. I did this last night and it disappeared. I don't know. I have no idea what happened to it, so I'm just going to try to get through it. Um, I wanted to do something that was uh, historical about the Ozark Plateau every week. And so this is from stateoftheozarks.net, SOTO. Uh, be, be sure and you know go there and just subscribe. You know he'll, he'll send you this every week. You can read it. I'm very interested. I have not even read or looked at it yet. Deep and Blue Ozark Springs. That is critical. I'm hoping that there will be some little bit of information there that might, uh, you know, trip the trigger, you know, float my boat, <laughs> you know, trip my trigger, float my boat, um, fuel my banana, whatever you want to call it. So, um, this is a historical article about a guy. And the reason that uh, I want to go ahead and read it is just it's got some interesting, you know, um, how life was back then and how it in some ways hasn't changed all that much. So, all right, Walker Powell, part two. I didn't read part one. Sorry, read it yourself. Go back and find it. <laughs> um, so let's see here, I think. Nope, okay. So tomato canning factory, that was the subject here. That was kind of before my time. It was 1907. A tornado came along and blew the thing over the side of the hill. Scattered the cans and everything. It was about two years old. I was about two years old when it was blowed away. My father was also in the hack tie hacking business. Hack ties? Nope. Railroad ties. <laughs> um, where they made railroad ties and cut them out by hand. I think he had six teams of horses and six wagons and a bunch of the hackers, tie hackers that worked for him. So he was in the tie business in a big way. He was always proud that he never had to work for another man. You know where you come off, come in off of 13, Highway 13, there's a road forks off to the left. And the other road, the road that goes to the left, went by our old homestead, and that's where I was born. Now Alden still lives there, and he sleeps in the same room that he was born in. Wow. That was quite a story, but it was before my time. There wasn't any tomato canning factory in this area. It was the first canning factory in Stone County. Now, Galen Chadwick in the uh, what we called the Golden Age of Missouri speech said that even little Stone County, as hilly as it is, produced 10,000 bushels of wheat annually back then, back in the day when farms the farms had houses that looked like plantation and they went to the bank with their head held high they were they did pretty good now this was maybe before that time i don't know there wasn't any da, 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 da. Um, he also canned peaches and other things and sold them to stores around here it looks like from that picture in there he hired about six employees there's three women and three men they had a little metal number that they dropped in their bucket when it was full and so when it went around that coin had a number on it and she was paid for her tomatoes in that bucket and they wore long skirts to work in. September would be the end of the tomatoes. That one factory in Reed Spring, Emerson's canning factory, shipped 90 carloads of canned tomatoes in one year. Now you can imagine how many tomatoes that would be. A good year, you could set a crate down by a tomato plant on these old hills where they say you can't grow anything. And uh, you could pick 40 pounds of tomatoes off that one plant. And they were sold for about $40 a ton back in those days. That would be about a wagon load. And that was good money back in those days. Some people were making 25 cents a day cutting cedar posts and stuff like that. They didn't have all this unemployment and stuff back in those days. You just toughed it out. If they could clear $3,000 off their tomatoes, they could probably make it through the winter. His father, Ralph Waldo Emerson Powell, <laughs> the Millers were the biggest tomato growers in the county. It was two brothers, and between the two of them, they had about 10 kids. And those kids started working in the field when they were just small. They lived over on DD. But the tomato canning, they had to take their tomatoes to Reed Spring to Emerson Canning Factory. If you go in that pizza parlor down in Reed Spring, he's got a lot of pictures of the Emerson Canning Factory. That fellow that's got that team of horses and an old buggy, that's Dr. Shoemate that delivered me when I was a baby. 
and my dad had to write into Reed Spring. Of course, <clears throat> I was born in the night, and he rode in there and got Doc Shoemate, and he rode back and delivered me. And Doc Shoemate had spurs on because he rode a horse, and he didn't bother about taking his spurs off when he was delivering me. And my mother never did forgive him for not taking his spurs off because they were jingling all around. She didn't like that. <laughs> Doc didn't get out much. He stayed at home and he took care of people when they came in. And that's a good picture of him there in that pizza parlor there with the nice big team. And then he had a four-horse hack that could hold four people. And then later he bought an old Model T <clears throat> Ford and he never did learn to drive very good. And when he got ready to go out, his car was parked there in Reed Spring. And he'd get in that car and start that thing and you could hear it all over Reed Spring. You knew Doc was going somewhere in it. He'd put the pedal clear to the floor. He was quite a character. He'd deliver a baby and take maybe a pound of tomatoes, potatoes, or chickens, or he didn't always take cash because people didn't always have it. He'd just take whatever they'd offer. <clears throat> I was an herb doctor at Silver Dollar City for two or three years, so I got a whole bookcase full of herb remedies. Back to Eden is one of the best books. You use them for both medicinal and cooking herbs, of course. Cayenne, you know, yeah. Uh, Dr. Uh, Schultz, anti-plague formula, one pound of equal parts of cayenne, ginger, horseradish, um, onion, and garlic. Blend it up, makes a tincture, makes a, you know, powerful tonic. Some you use for cooking and some you use, there's mullen. Just before you get to the mailbox, you look down there and you can see all that mullen. Oh, yeah, he went on a fun rabbit trail. Um, it's got wide leaf kind of a fuzz on it Indian toilet paper and some of the ladies would rub it on their cheeks to make them red <clears throat> another thing they'd use that bat guano for was their eyebrows <laughs> skunk they used in perfume my ma'am you smell good and you look your eyebrows look like shit <laughs> you know <laughs> well there's a picture right in there with me um, I was 13 15 16 years old and buddy was my pet she was a pretty coyote I got her when she just had her eyes open. She was starved to death because we caught her mama and she didn't have anything to eat. So the old man that was with us, he found the pups there under a bluff. So they was hungry. So he kind of called them out, but he didn't have anything to put them in. He had a pair of coveralls and so he tied the legs together and stuck the pups down in there. Then he had his long underwear on, you know. <laughs> so then we went up to the neighbors, Oscar Marles. So he fed the little pups some milk. Um, Buddy was two years old when she died. I, I think I missed something there. She was tied down there at the cave at a bush where it was cool and she could get in the spring and get water from the creek. Some people went down there and was having their lunch there and kids saw her down there and started throwing rocks at her and got her excited and she jumped around and run a stob in her eye. My dad had cut some sprouts and left stobs about like that and she ran one of them right into her eye and it killed her. She was beautiful. She was just like a dog, very lovable and everything. I could take her with me on my trap line, and she would follow along. And I was always afraid she was going to step in one of my traps, but she knew where those things were, and she'd jump over them. She was smart. She could run into a flock of quail and take off and jump and catch one six or eight feet in the air, and a rabbit didn't stand a chance. She'd start doing this, weaving back and forth, and grab them like that. She killed it and eat it if I'd let her. She didn't share her food with me. We had turkeys, and I kept a 20-foot chain on her tied to a cedar limb. And what would spring, and those turkeys would, darn turkeys would get right up close around her, and she grabbed them in the tail feathers. I don't know why those turkeys loved to get right up there where she could grab them. Turkey's not the smartest in the world. <laughs> There's a lot of rattlesnakes over there, too. When my dad opened the cave, there was a lot of snakes, rattlesnakes especially. This was the uh, timber rattlers. Now the hogs that run here, the old hogs they turned out, they would kill a lot of those snakes, grab them and kill them. And a rattlesnake would bite a hog but wouldn't affect it at all. The fat wouldn't let the poison in. Now if it would bite a dog in front of the head, in front of the heart, it wouldn't kill them. He'd bite them back of the heart, it would kill them. There was one time I was out in the yard of playing and it was just about sundown and I was heading for the house so I started out at a run and I saw this thing a laying and thought I'd better jump over that. I thought it was a stick. Come to find out it was a rattlesnake, big rattlesnake. 
I wouldn't have kicked it but once. That would have been it. So it got under the house. My dad said, I'll fix that. He went down to the barn. He kept a big king snake there, pretty good size one down there, and it stayed, it stayed there to kill the rats. So he brought it up to the house and stuck it under the house. So black snakes will kill rattlesnakes and eat them. Uh, my t son told me that, and I got online and looked, and I, had I saw a video of a, you know, about the same size, but this thing got it behind the neck, and I don't know how it was a little tiny head it had, but anyway, it must have worked itself around, and you know, it has the tail, the tail was rattling as it went in, <laughs> and then the thing, instead of just like pausing and you know, like go to sleep and digesting it, it just slithered off into the sunset like nothing happened with the whole snake inside of it. Oh my gosh. <sighs> yeah, it's cold in here. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Creepy. Hey, Jersey, by the way, both heaters are working. I think they just need a break. I don't know. I turned that one on and it hurt and started working right away, which is nice because it's pretty chilly in here. The older one I've got right here at my feet. Um, thank you. <laughs> Ooh, thumbs up. <laughs> Hey, you got to be decisive. You got to take decisive action, and and she does. So, so the men of the house had to go fishing the next day. Oh, we got to go fishing. I'm sorry. There's a snake under the house. Who cares? <laughs> we got to go fishing. See ya. <laughs> so he left, left Marjorie and Mama and me there by ourselves. And so in the meantime, I didn't. I don't know who found the snake, but it had crawled out from under the house. So Mama hollered at Marjorie, and so she grabbed my dad's ten gauge. Now, twelve gauge is big, but man, ten gauge. That's a big hole. 10 gauge means that 10 round balls, the diameter of that, will equal a pound. 12 gauge, it takes 12 of them. 20 gauge, it takes 20 of them. 4 10 is, doesn't apply. <laughs> Maybe it does. 410. Hmm, interesting. Huh? I don't know. Probably does. All right. Interesting. I never thought of that before. I never read, actually read that. I know that 12, 10, and 20. Um... Went and grabbed my dad's 10-gauge double-barrel shotgun. That's a weapon. She went out there and bang, missed it. So she picked up the chopping axe that was laying there by the wood pile and cut that thing's head off about a foot behind its head. So it started crawling around, you know, and there are these three or four Airedale pups I had. It was about three or four months old, took out after it, and that thing bit those dogs in the face. Their heads swelled up, but it didn't kill them. Those Airedales would tackle anything. We raised them mostly. My dad used them to catch these hogs out in the woods. And they'd go up and grab the old sow by the ear and they'd hold her till my dad would get up and hog tie her. I don't know why they call it hog tying. <laughs> so she couldn't get up and then turn those Airedales and they'd catch those little pigs so we could put a mark in their ear to tell who they belonged to. Put a notch here lower and that was a under bit. And put one up here and that was a double bit. And then that was registered just like a brand is over at Stone County. And the neighbors would come and get him when they had hogs they wanted to catch. They used those Airedales. I grew up with a female. I was five or six years old. She would stay right with me. I would put a string around her neck and lead her around, you know. One time I took her up behind the garden and tied her to a little tree. And she didn't come in at night. And they got to wondering where old Wiggles was. Well, I started to think, well, I know where she's at. She's tied up to the tree. <clears throat> They are great dogs. They are good watchdogs. We never did pet our dogs like people do. Of course, old Wiggles, she just took up with me. Old Smoke, he was a male, so I'd get up on the cistern and throw a rock down there and make him mad, and here he'd come. Mama would say, that dog is going to bite you if you don't quit that. I said, he won't bite me, but he'd sure act like it. I'd throw that rock, and here he'd come. <laughs> there were what you call medium-sized Airedales. We raised the Orangle which is a big Airedale, and we'd, so, and we'd sold those, and we sold those. I might tell you things you wouldn't believe. I've seen a lot of different things in my life, but it's, it's just like growing up in two different worlds. Both have their advantages. We didn't have the medication back then. We doctored mostly with herbs and stuff like that. We never heard of a doctor's appointment. We never heard of such a thing. Now every whip stitch you get, you go to a doctor's appointment. Yeah, I just say, uh, I've got five children, and we're not that far off from him, you know. Uh, even having lived in Denver, five children, 150 years of life total, 
One time my youngest son fell out of a tree and broke his arm when we got here to Missouri. It took that long to go to a doctor. So, and it was just to, you know, set it and put it in a cast and whatnot. So other than that, no insurance, no doctor's appointments, no medications, no drugs, no crap. No. You can do it. You don't have to have Obamacare, you know. Insanity, you know. That bottle of salt back there, great Celtic sea salt we've used for about 40 years, and that's that's our medicine, salt. And uh, herbs and colloidal silver and what else is down here? I don't know. You know, good vitamins, good food. Stay away from the drugs, man. No alfalfa, you know, herb blacks, herbs. So... I worked at Silver Dollar City for 30 years. I still like the old lathe the best. When I first started, I worked winter in construction, and then they put me in food service for two years, and I didn't like that a whole lot. I was cooking great big roasts overnight, and then the next evening I would cut them up and serve them to the people. We had five different entrees. We had chicken. We had beef. We had some fish, steak. It was a pretty good business. I retired twice from Neo City. I retired once when I was building this house. My mother never believed in wasting anything. She used to eat the neck of the chicken, like I did too, you know. <laughs> that was her favorite piece, and gizzards and livers and hearts. Yeah. Oh, yeah, gizzards and livers and hearts. Oh, yeah, oh, my. <laughs> we, I don't know, my, my parents always bought those, maybe because they were cheap, you know. Um, and we'd buy her a sweater for Christmas and wait for her to put it on when she was going somewhere. Mom, why don't you wear your new sweater? Oh, I'm saving it. I'm going to save it. She didn't want to wear it out. She knew how she, we knew how she was. She was very, very. She didn't even want you to come in and see her wash her feet. I go out to Silver Dollar City and see many of the people I started working with. Think of them, just like brothers and sisters. We'll all be in heaven sometime and get to associate with each other. That's what Larry Sifford. He drives me to church. He tells me how wonderful we're going to be up in heaven, and we'll be enjoying each other's company. I guess. I don't know why. God's leaving me here all this time. I should have been dead a long time ago, 10 years ago. My age, none of my family ever lived past 75. Well, my mother did live to 93. Why? She And she ate salt? You wouldn't believe how much she ate salt. She preserved herself good. What have I been saying? See? Corroboration. Salt preserves life. Salt preserves hides. Salt preserves meat. Salt preserves fish. She preserved herself good. I got home from the Air Force, came over there to eat one time and got some eggs. And my gosh, she salted those eggs so I couldn't hardly eat them. I wasn't used to that much salt by that time. In the wintertime, our diet was pork home cured in a smokehouse. All cooking was done with pure lard. We had rheumatiz but had never heard of arthritis or cholesterol. We drank sassafras tea for a blood thinner. July 18, 2013. So there's a little taste of the Ozarks so I thought that was pretty cute and there, there was a picture of them with him, him and his coyote you know like I said subscribe to the magazine it's free um, good historical stuff and I, I'm assuming that if you go to their website you could go back and get the past archives there's a ton of good good articles and you know it's not any kind of religious base it's just the flavoring of the Ozarks I read that article the other day by um, Wendell whatever his name was um, twix the hills, the land twix the hills, the land twix the Rocky Mountain hills and the Appalachian hills. This is the land twix the hills, the land twix the rivers, the Mississippi, the Missouri, and the Arkansas. All right, come visit y'all. Y'all, are we good to go or? All right, I'm running it with my thumb. This is Jerry Diamond. If you're listening to this, you are the remnant. Come on. Oh, that's good. I should probably lay it down and tap. Did it work? Oh, that's kind of frustrating. Okay. Uh, hit pause.